Before we can simulate, we need to set a model up with uh, the necessary entities that are going to be simulated. Uh, in this case, we're going to use an activity cycle diagram and the entities will appear as simple tokens. In a computer program, they are small uh, data records. We also need to set the clock up to zero and set up an event list into which we can record future events. In the example I'm going to show now, we're going to apply the three phase approach. So here's our beer drinker model. We have three classes of entity, glass, barmaid and beer drinker. We can see each of the life cycles clearly in the diagram. There are two activities, filling and emptying, and four queues. In order to fill a glass, we need to have both an empty glass and a barmaid waiting to refill. So we will need to have one token at least in each of those two queues in order to trigger the filling activity. You can think of the arrows leading into an activity as being a condition test. In this case, it's an and conjunction. So we need to have an empty glass and we need to have a barmaid waiting for a refill. We've also numbered each of the activities and the numbering has an effect, as you'll see when we do the algorithm, because we will look at filling before we look at emptying, because we've labelled filling as number one and emptying as number two. The ordering can sometimes have an effect on the behaviour of a model and the business rules that are actually applied. And you'll see that in another lecture or you've already heard that from me. We've also got some times. These are the activity durations. They're shown as fixed values for the purpose of this demonstration, but in practice they might be samples from a, a, a distribution. So here are our entities and we're going to load them into the model. Just to remind ourselves we've got the activity numbers and we've also got the activity durations. So we'll put our three glasses into the empty queue and likewise into the waiting to drink and waiting to refill queue. It's normal when we start a simulation at time zero to have the entities in waiting states rather than engaged already in any, in any activity. So the start phase and the three phase approach is the C phase, the conditional phase. And we call this the ABC approach because ABC sounds a lot nicer than CAB. Um, and you can see there for that we've actually in the executive program in the lower left, that green table, you can see that I've put crosses against A and B, indicating that we are currently working on the C phase. And you'll see this as we move through. So the logic says for each activity in turn, and that's underlined because it depends the, the activity numbering is what we're doing there. We're checking activity number one completely before we move on to look at activity number two. So for each activity in turn, test to see if it can start by looking at the queues that lead into that activity and checking to see whether there is at least one entity in each queue. So move these into the activity and determine the time the activity will end. We know what that will be because we can add our current clock time, which when we begin is zero, we can add that, uh, add to that the activity duration. And we'll see that in a short while. And this is known as the C phase because it involves a conditional test to see whether the activity can start. So let's just have a look at that. So we take an entity, an empty glass, glass number one and the barmaid, and we can now schedule that in the event list. And we can see we've got activity one for glass one. I've denoted that as 1.1. .1. So the end event for 1.1 .1 will take place at time three, 3.0. That's the clock time of zero plus the activity duration of three. And then we say, can anything else start? Can we start filling again? And the answer now is no, because there's no token in the wait to refill queue. And we can now look at activity number two, the emptying activity, and that can't start either, because although we've got a beer drinker who's thirstily waiting to drink, there is no full glass for them to drink from, so we can't start emptying. So that's exhausted the whole of what we can do in this start phase. So we'll put a tick in the box, in the executive program on the left to show where we've got up to in the algorithm and we'll move on to the next phase which is the time advance or the A phase and advance the clock to the earliest, earliest activity end time which is simple in this case because there is only one event in the event list and so the choice is not tricky. In a large simulation the event list might have hundreds or even thousands of events and we'll have to scan through that list to find out the most imminent event. In this case it's three. So we can advance the clock to time three and that's all that we have to do at this stage. So I can put a cross in the box to tell us that we're now moving to the bound phase, the B phase. So here we are. It says all end all activities due to end at the current clock time. The current clock time is time three. Okay. 
we updated the clock in the previous step, uh, and send all participating entities to their destination queues. And this is known as the bound phase, the B phase, because we early determined this. It's only dependent on the passage of time. There is no condition testing. When that time three comes up, we then do the following. We move the glass into its full queue and the barmaid goes back to wait for a refill. And having done that, we've also put a line through the event and the event list because that's now finished. It's, it's done. We put a cross in the bound phase because there's nothing else bound to happen at time three, just event 1.1. And so we're back at the start phase now. Can we start activity one? And the answer, of course, is yes, because we've got entities in the participating queues. So we can move those entities into the filling activity and determine the end time, which is now the current clock time three plus the duration three. So that's six. So in the event list, we've got 1.2 the end event for activity one for glass number two, and that will take place at time six. We can also start emptying because we've now got a full glass and the beer drinker can be scheduled and that's activity two for glass one, we'll call that 2.1. Current clock time is three, plus an activity duration of seven gives us a end time of 10, and that appears in the event list. This is called scheduling events. So that's what we've done here. We've scheduled two events, one at six minutes and one at 10 minutes. Well, that's all that uh, can be done at this stage. That's the end of the start phase. OK, and so we can now move to advance the clock. We now look through our event list and we see that the most imminent event is at time six. I highlighted that in red for you. And we can now move that across into the clock record. We can update the clock to time six. And that's all we do at the time advance. And we can now move forward to the B phase, the bound. What was bound to happen at time six? Well, at time six, it was, if you look in the event list, it was activity or event 1.2. So that's the filling activity for glass two. So we can now move that through its life cycle, move the barmaid back to there and cross that off the list. It's now completed, at, uh, 1.2 is complete. Nothing else is bound to happen at time six. So we can move to the next phase, which is the start phase. And we can see therefore that we can now move glass three from the empty state and schedule the filling of glass three. Take the barmaid in and the end time is going to be time six plus three is nine minutes. We schedule that in the event list 1.3, activity one for glass three at time nine. OK, and we just carry on doing this and it will carry on looping forever until we decide to stop doing it, which I'm going to do now. And I'm now just going to jump ahead to look at what this looks like in a, in a short while. So I've moved the clock forward to time 10 just to show you that, in fact, the time increment is variable. Now, that's a characteristic of discrete event simulation is that we can move the time forward as far as it can possibly go. And this has advantages in modeling and simulation of operational systems because it allows us to, to, to simulate over long time scales, much longer than we'd normally be able to do if we're using a fixed time slicing approach, which is far less time efficient. So we've looked at the three phase approach. There are other approaches that apply slightly different algorithms. Just remind yourself it has three phases. They're A, B, C, but they actually start with C. And the C phase has a condition test and the B test. The B phase is only dependent on the passage of time. OK, I hope that's been useful and uh, you can go back and look at this and stop it and start it to your heart's content to see how to execute um, the three phase approach uh, using an activity cycle diagram. Of course, in practice, you're going to be using FlexSim or other tools, and this will all be hidden behind the scenes um, and is being done for you by the software.